Okay, friends, so um, in honor of Passover and uh, so that we can be best prepared really for the Seder, I wanna take us today through seven big ideas that appear both at the Seder night and of course during the entire festival of Passover. Seven ideas that uh, speak not just of the history of Passover, but more importantly, I think of the relevance of Passover and its meaning uh, today in our day and age. <clears throat> now, before we begin this, uh, to, uh, before I share my screen and we explore these seven big ideas, I do want to share the overarching theme of Passover. Passover is called Passover uh, because, uh, of course, it relates technically, the word Passover or Pesach in Hebrew, uh, which also means Passover, relates technically to the idea that the angel of death was passing over the Jewish homes as he executed the 10th plague which was the plague of killing all of the Egyptian firstborns. He passed over the Jewish homes to spare them uh, and their home from the death of the firstborn and instead went to all the homes of the Egyptians he passed over. But the big question of course is why choose such a name? First of all, a name that has a negative connotation, a connotation of death. Why choose a name like that for such a happy Passover, a uh, happy holiday? And secondly, also why why speak of this, of, of this miracle? I mean, there were 10 plagues. And does this miracle really encapsulate the idea of freedom, which is the theme of Passover? Why call it Passover after a plague that is only one of 10 plagues that doesn't seem to encapsulate the message of Passover and at the same time again, it has a negative connotation to it. And the big idea really is because on Passover, as we'll see through these seven ideas, on Passover, we are asked to pass over our own limitations. It's not just where the name Passover does not just relate to the angel of death passing over the Jewish homes, but it really relates to our ability to pass over, to overcome any bad inclination, any ha bad habit we have, any bad impulse we have, any negative trait we have. It is our duty on Passover in order to really relive the, the story of Passover to figure out what it is that's holding us back and to try and pass over Pesach over all of these limits uh, because only then can we truly be free. And therefore the name Passover and therefore this message really encapsulates uh, the, the theme of, of this holiday. But for now I wanna share my screen and go directly to these seven insights that again stem from the Seder night also from the story of Passover altogether, and we can explore them one by one. Okay, you should have received these uh, PDFs by Janet via email before. Uh, we'll share the screen now anyway, so it's, it's not like you need them, but after the class, Janet, right? We'll send them to all. Thank you, as always, for doing so. All right. I, I did send them out. Oh, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Okay, so idea number one. Why celebrate the Exodus? Does anyone want to read? Anyone? Oh, please, Julie, see you raising your hand as always. Thank you. Go for it. Why, why are we celebrating an event that, ha that occurred over 3,300 years ago? Right. The if holiday? I may stop you, Julie, it's interesting just to note, this year we are celebrating an event that occurred not just over 3,300 years ago, but to be more exact, that occurred 3,300 years and 33 years ago, four threes, three, 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 three. I'm sure there's a Kabbalistic significance to that. And the number three, by the way, is a big Jewish number. That, that's uh, the number three is a number of unity because when you have one, then you only have one singular opinion. Two, then you have an argument, but the third one comes and ties the, the two together. So it's a number of unity. Uh, also the Torah was given on the third month, the third Hebrew month of Sivan. It's a month of holiness, of unity. Uh, it's a number of holiness and unity. So I'm sure there's some significance to this number, 3333. Three, three. But in any case, it's just interesting to know uh, the exact number. But go for it. Go ahead. The holiday of Pesach, commemorating the exodus of the Jewish people from the land of Egypt, also reflects the liberation of the soul from the psychological and emotional constraints represented by Egypt. What is Egypt? The Hebrew term for Egypt, Mizraim, may be translated as inhibitions or restrictions. All of us struggle with various inner and outer inhibitions that stifle our growth and prevent us from maximizing our potentials. 
We may be paralyzed by fear, insecurity, shame, guilt, doubts, conflicts, resentment, codependency, and addictions. We may be stuck in relationships, personal or at work, that are not good for us, but we are paralyzed to do anything about it. Conversely, we may be stuck in our inability to build a relationship. We may be lacking the ability to love, to dream, to cry, and to let go of our defenses, or we may be enslaved by unhealthy urges and feelings of envy, animosity, and bitterness. We may be too afraid to be honest with ourselves and with others, to look ourselves in the mirror and make the hard choices we have to make. So here is a suggestion for the Seder night. Tonight, think of one particular thing in your life which is holding you back from greatness and how you can overcome it. Then make the resolution to do one daring thing that will help you get out of this inhib inhibiting Egypt. It may be as simple as making that telephone call that frightens you, confronting that person that scares you, changing that habit, jumping into that project, taking that risk. Whatever it may be, you are the one who knows best, and tonight you owe yourself the gift of liberation. Right. Okay, so that's really the big idea of Passover. That's why, again, the term for, uh, or the word for Egypt in Hebrew is the same word for inhibitions or limits, restrictions. And that's because we are not just celebrating the Grand Exodus three of 3,333 years ago, but we're celebrating the Grand Exodus of today. Our ability to come out of our own shrine, our own Egypt, or our own restrictions. Now, by the way, I, I just want to quote the passage of the Talmud which is an important passage because very often we say to ourselves, well, that's impossible. You know, I'm already a slave of my habits. You can't teach an old dog a new trick, right? How does that expression go? Uh, and we give ourselves all sorts of excuses. So it's important to quote the Talmud that says that Adam me'at milemata ve which means that all that God requires of us to do is one step, just one little action. We might say, yes, there's so much we need to change and we won't be able to change everything overnight. But we can at least change one thing. And by changing that one thing, as the Talmud guarantees, then God will join us, partner with us, and ensure that, that, that our path is paved, that liberation occurs. Uh, or to quote another passage from the Talmud, which is a beautiful analogy, I believe, is, Pitchuli petach shel machat, which means this, open up, God is begging us, begging us, as we think of this idea, to open up for him just a little opening, even as small as the hole of a needle, right? The hole of a needle is tiny, just, just big enough to insert that thread. So give me just that little opening, God is begging us. And if you're giving me that little opening, then I will open for you the opening of the world. That's, those are the words of the Talmud. So let us not be intimidated by how much we need to change. All we really need to do is one little opening, one little change, one little uh, uh, riddance of, of a bad habit, of a bad action or, or, or bad relationship or whatever it may be. And then God will come and help us out. That's, uh, that's really the big idea of, of this grand exodus. I, I, I want to point out that, you know, I grew up in South Africa and in South Africa, maybe the best selling book is Nelson Mandela's book of the long walk to freedom. And Nelson Mandela's point really in his book was that it takes many, 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 many steps. It's a long walk to freedom, but that freedom begins really with just one step. We do just that one step, then we're already much closer to freedom than we ever were. And that's the way he fought his fight to freedom. But in a way, I think it's, it's a very Jewish idea, even though it was said by Mandela, but it's a very Jewish idea. All God wants us to do is take that one step. And one step eventually leads us really to freedom. And here again, the Talmud says that we won't be alone then as we continue on in this journey, God will join us and open up the opening of the, of the world for us. So... That's one big idea. Of course, please, this should be a two-way street, right? A, a dialogue, not a monologue. So if you have any comments, questions, or anything, please feel free to share your uh, thoughts. Otherwise, we can move to insight number two. No, anything. Okay, insight number two. 
I think, I don't know, I can't see you all because the screen is shared. So you're all in this limited window on, my, on, on the side of my screen, but maybe you are trying to say something and all you have to do is unmute yourself. So remember to unmute yourself if you do want to say something. Otherwise, we'll go to insight number two. Does anyone want to read? Anyone? Janet, go for it, please. Thank you. The three most important, ing oh, the three necessary items for freedom. The right. three most important ingredients at the Seder table are the wine, matzah, and maror, which is the bitter herbs. For these three items capture the three foundational ideas that can allow us to set ourselves free. A, the first step is wine. Wine has incredible power. When wine enters, secrets come out, says the Talmud. Wine represents the secrets in us, for wine itself is a secret. It is initially hidden and concealed with the grape, and it takes much labor to extract it from the source. The grapes have to be crushed and the wine to ferment. Wine, an intoxicating beverage that is at first concealed within the grape, represents the deeply concealed powerful forces lingering within the human psyche. Right. Go for it. The first step. The first step in setting yourself free is real, realizing how much more there is to you than what meets the eye. You must recognize your potential. What were you really meant to be? What are you capable of becoming for you to break out, for you to break out of the chains? Right, just stop there for a second. So that's step one represented by wine. Wine is hidden within the grape, so to speak. The grape doesn't know that it has wine within until it looks inward, almost crushes itself, and then extracts that wine from it. Without that process, the wine will forever remain concealed. Same with human beings. We have this delicious wine within us. We're like grapes. And we want, no, we want, no, the taste of this wine. We want, no, the power of this wine that, uh, as mentioned, uh, as the common mentions, reveals secrets, right? We want, no, the magic of this wine. If we don't go inward, crush ourselves a little bit or our outer image, and focus more on our inner image. And only then will this wine come out. And that's really the first step of freedom. And that's why this necessary item on the Seder plate. I will say this, that what's interesting is this, that uh, this analogy is, is quite accurate because very often, unfortunately, it takes some crushing to discover this wine. Sometimes it's the challenges of life indeed mm. that enable us to dig inward or that force us to dig inward and then discover skills that maybe we weren't even aware that we had. You know, I'm thinking of King David. What made King David, King David? David was a simple shepherd. What made him one of the most famous and maybe most powerful kings of history, of Jewish history at least. And what made him uh, King David, what made the simple shepherd into a big king was Goliath. Goliath, that's how he rose to fame, right? That challenge with a giant of mankind, with a vicious man, is what made David King David. Without Goliath, David would have remained a simple shepherd. And sometimes, sometimes life throws at us all sorts of Goliaths or all sorts of Goliath moments. But it is those moments that crush our grapes, so to speak. And then we reveal the wine, then we've revealed the king within. So that's the first necessary step to freedom, represented by wine. Let's go to number two. This comes together, go for it. Should I continue? Yes, please, Janet. Or somebody else want to read? Or somebody else wants to read, or even better, does someone want to share an idea, a disagreement, something? <laughs> okay, so you continue, Janet, go for it. This comes together with step two, the maror, representing the bitterness caused by slavery. You have to remember how dysfunction the slavery is in order to be inspired towards liberation and to actualize freedom in your life. The most dangerous darkness is when you think it is light. Mm -hmm. For a Jew not to be fully in sync with his or her inner soul, with the essence of existence, is slavery. It creates a void, an inner emptiness, a lack of real joy. That is the maror. That is what allows us and encourages us to grow in our lives as humans and as Jews. Right. It's interesting. Think about this. When we, are, when we have bitterness in our life, our first instinct is to try and get rid of it. During the Seder night, we don't get rid of the bitterness. In fact, we eat it. We internalize it. 
Why? Why bring bitterness into our lives? Why even taste bitterness? What's the whole point? We're trying to be free, right? We're trying to celebrate freedom. That's what Passover is about. So why incorporate bitterness into the Seder? And why even yeah. eat? Maybe we can look at it, but why not? Yes, Julie, go for it. Um, so, well, without bitterness, you can't really appreciate good goodness, good times when things are going right. Right. V very good. That's right. Without bit so bitterness gives us that contrast. Without bitterness, we can appreciate sweetness, right? Without darkness, we can appreciate life, uh, right? So, so without imprisonment, in a way, or psychological imprisonment, we can appreciate freedom, which is the theme of Passover. So that's right. But I think it goes even deeper than that. And this is what this is saying. And that is that in life, we ought to be bitter. Bitterness is actually a good quality. It's not something we have to throw away. Why? Because bitterness shakes us to the point that we will never accept the status quo. We'll always seek to grow. We'll always tr strive to change, not just change that which is bad within us, but to change the world. If we don't have bitterness, then we seek into com our comfort zone. Then we become almost uh, robots. And, uh, or like Rabbi Steinsatz would often say, then we become good couch potatoes. But that's not the goal of Judaism. The goal of Judaism is to have, have really this bitterness that, that changes, changes us and changes the world around us. So we eat the moral so that we, we teach ourselves and we teach our children that it's fine to be a little bit bitter. Of course, it, it, it must be just a, a small dose, but still we need to have that small dose that keeps us going keeps us wanting to become better and better, keeps us wanting to change the world more and more and more, and never allows us to rest on our laurels. And I'm reminded of the story of Zero Mostel. You remember Zero Mostel on Broadway? One of the biggest Jewish actors of history. Fiddler. American actors. Sorry, Janet. Fiddler on the roof. Fiddler on the roof, that's right. Yeah, well, you know why his name was Zero? His name was Zero because his father, growing up, would often, often tell Zero, uh, Zero Mostel, who had ADD for sure, I mean, it wasn't diagnosed then, and uh, could not sit still, as they call it in Yiddish, he didn't have Zitzfleisch. What well, Zitzfleisch is, have you ever heard of that expression? Zitzfleisch. Or he had Spilkes. <laughs> Spilkes, right? that's another expression. Zitzfleisch is, flesh means flesh, Zitz means to sit. So sitting flesh. He didn't have sitting flesh, sits flesh. And uh, his father would get very frustrated and upset at him that he would very often tell him, uh, tell Zero Mostel, he would tell him, Dubi is the Gurnish. You are nothing. You are a zero. Right. So Zero Mostel growing up needed not, went to then become an actor and he needed, he needed a stage name. So he decided to pick the name Zero to prove to his father that he thought he would become a zero. Look what a big zero I became. <laughs> the whole world knows me. That's how big my zero is. Now I'm thinking to myself, look at Zero Mostel. He did the Jewish thing. He didn't run away from the bitterness. He didn't try to fight it. He didn't sink into depression. He didn't go to therapy. I mean, maybe he did, but he didn't sink into that therapy and say, well, I am a nothing. Look, I'm a victim. My father ruined my life. I'll never have a future. Quite the opposite. He said, I'll take that bitterness, incorporate it, and allow, allow it to shake my life so that I can never rest on my laurels. And I do achieve success. And I do continue to grow. And I do continue to find uh, as much, as, you know, as much of, a, of, of a pathway to, to rise and to change the world. And so he took that zero and turned it into a big zero. So that moral sometimes can be very good, of course, in a small dosage, but still. It needs to be incorporated into our lives to enable us to continue to grow. And we might think that we're zeros, but let's prove to the world that we're big zeros. And we can only do that with a little bit of moral. Rabbi, this, yes, Julie. this is just a funny little thing. Billy Idol, the singer, was told by a teacher that he was idle, that he'd do nothing. And yeah. so his stage name he made Idol just spelled it differently. Oh. I, I it's see, I a little bit like the zero mustel. Right, that's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, I never knew that. Very nice, very nice. I like stories like that. They took their maror and, and you know, channeled it to, to become greater. 
Beautiful. Now, well, that's exactly what we're talking about. This is the idea here. So we have the wine, then we have the maror. The wine, again, that tells us that there's so much more to us than what our naked eye sees. The maror, which is the bitterness of our experiences in life that we ought to keep, that we ought to incorporate into our lives so that they can shake us in order for growth to then um, occur. And then number three, and that's the matzah. See, does anyone want to read? Then we have the critical step of matzah. I'll read. Please, please, Robin. Yes, I can see it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Then we have the critical step of matzah. We eat the matzah, says the Haggadah, because the Jews did not have time to wait till the dough had been has risen. They rushed out of Egypt. They rushed out of Egypt. Right. I want to ask you, they waited for 210 years. They could not wait another few hours. What was the rush? Right. The answer is beautiful. The greatest enemy to setting yourself free is delaying things, hard decisions and bald, mo bald moves. The message of matzah is when it comes to setting yourself free, you have no time to wait even an extra 18 minutes. Do it now. Make that call now. Send that email now. Make that move now. Set up that meeting now. Make that decision now. Start the new behavior now. Confront the situation now. Start doing it now. Or as the Lubavitch Le rabbi put it, anything worth doing is worth doing now. Right, exactly. You know, there's a beautiful teaching in the ethics of our fathers that says, which means, don't say when the time will come, uh, when the time will be right, I will do it. Because that time will never be right. Or uh, exactly like the Lubavitch Rebbe put it, anything we're doing is worth doing now. Very often we're, we're slaves of our past and therefore we can't really live the now. But sometimes all that is needed to do is focus on the now. The now is really all we have. And that's why we ought to give it our best shot. And that's what the matzah represents. Or more importantly, the, the matzah that represents that rush of coming out of Egypt. If you have a bad habit to get rid of, in Egypt to get rid of, get rid of it now. Rush out of it. Don't wait. Very often we wait for you know, our birthday. We wait for our anniversary. We wait for the new year to make good resolutions. Well, that's not the Jewish approach. You have something right to be done and do it right now. Okay. Um, all right. So those are the three necessary items and what they represent. Now, uh, insight number three, invite yourself to the Seder. And does anyone want to read? And, <laughs> Julie, go for it. Fine, right, go for it. Invite yourself to the Seder. Whoever is hungry, let him come and eat. Whoever is in need, let him come and conduct the Seder of Passover. Right. By the way, that's the line that we say at the very beginning of the Seder. Once uh, we're all together around the table, that's how we begin the Seder. I mean, that, that line is that in, in every Haggadah, the opening of every Maggid, uh, that stage of the Haggadah in which we tell the story of Egypt. So go for it. Continue. Since when do you invite people to an event once the event started? And if you want to invite new guests, go outside and invite people. Why are you inviting those that are already here? The answer is powerful. This statement isn't an invitation to others. It is an invitation to you. Invite your entire being to take part in this vulnerable journey from enslavement through your personal and collective pain and suffering all the way out of Egypt to seeing yourself differently than the way we entered. So every year, we will begin with an invitation to our own selves. Right. So whoever is hungry, somewhere inside you, there's someone that's hungry. And it's that person that you need to invite. Uh, very often, you know, there's a, a line in a Song of Songs, uh, authored by King Solomon, that says, <laughs> which means that they have made me the guardians, the guardian of vineyards. But I... I I failed to guard my own vineyard. Very often we face outward so much and sometimes for good reasons. We want to be kind. We want to be good. That who do we forget the most? We forget ourselves the most. My own vineyard I did not guard. In the words of King Solomon. And here on Passover, we acknowledge the idea that in order to be free, we first have to invite ourselves. If you don't take care of yourself first, you won't be able to take care of the world. Abba Steinlitz would very often tell me that 
uh, once you learn to master yourself, then you'll be able to master the world. But if you don't know how to master yourself, then you won't be able to master the world. So begin the, 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 or in the words of Gandhi, right? The famous words of Gandhi, be the change that you want to see in the world. It begins with you. If you live your, leave yourself out of the picture and you don't invite yourself to this story of passing over, of coming out of your own Egypt, then you'll never be able to truly be free. So we begin by inviting ourselves to the Seder. And it's a very, very powerful idea. Um, you know, right, the, there's a great story about the late Lubavitcher Rebbe, of Shnison of Blessed Memory, who uh, was once approached by a hippie. I think it was in the 60s or in the 70s. And um, uh, the, the, they had a private audience together and this man was talking about uh, how the world needs to change. And that the whole reason for the hippie movement is because we don't accept the status quo of the world, as this hippie was saying. And we need to infuse it really with love and with peace. And all we need is love and peace and love, etc., etc. And uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe turned to him, forget his name, but it's a published story. And he said to him, well, you speak about peace and love and how the world needs to change. These are novel ideas and I fully agree with you. I feel in the same way. I can ask you, are you at peace with your own family members? Do you speak to your parents? Suppose the rabbi saw something that he knew people and he sensed that there was something wrong. And this man indeed did not have a relationship with his parents for whatever reason, not because they weren't alive. They were very much alive, but he didn't get along with them. And the rabbi then turned to him while well, you speak about making peace and love with the entire world, but you can't make it within your own family. How do you expect to make peace and love in the world if you can't do it yourself with your own parents? And uh, it's a powerful message. I mean, I, I think it's so true. Very often we, we're way out there. Yeah, the whole world needs to change. What about our own circle? Let's put it this way. If we were to take care of our own circle, then we wouldn't need to have peace and love in the world. There would be peace in the world, uh, peace and love in the world because everyone would take care of their own circle. The whole reason that we need peace and love in this world is because we don't have this philosophy where it starts from within. If, if, if we had it from within, we wouldn't need it from without. So, so that's, that's really the idea. We have to invite ourselves, speak about coming out of Egypt. Let us come out of our own Egypt first, and then we'll be able to uh, help the world come out of its Egypt too. That's, that's the big idea. Invite yourself to the Seder. Okay, number four, not the cookie cutter model, anyone? Anyone want to continue? I'll read, to I'll read. Oh, thank you, who's I? It's Sue. Oh, Sue, yes, yes. Okay. I can um, hear you, but I can't see you. No. Um, that's almost, a problem. <laughs> almost like an angel. <laughs> okay. Go for it, go ahead. All right. Now, can you see me? What? Mm -hmm. Oh, now I lost. Doesn't it. matter. Doesn't matter. Go, go, go. Read, please. I, I don't want. I don't want to complicate things for you. Go ahead. All right, but I just moved my screen. Okay, there it is. Start. Should I start with no two children are alike? And not. Uh, yeah, the Torah speaks of four children. Four That's children. Funny. One is wise. One is wicked. One is simple, and one does not know how to ask. Hagada. Three critical educational points are being conveyed in this passage. Number one, no two children are alike and no, not two children can be spoken to alike. We sometimes want to create a cookie cutter model, which one si where one size fits all. 3000 years ago, the Torah told us it will not work. The message you, you give one child is not the one you can give to a second child. There are different types of children with different personality types, skills, challenges, and gifts. You must find the proper words to speak to each one. You must discover the proper mechanisms through which to penetrate each one of them. Number two, despite these four being so different, they are all your children. Never give up on any of them or tell yourself that this one is too difficult. I do not want or to, or I can't deal with him, her. 
This approach is categorically rejected. All these four are your children. They may be different in so many years, but what unites them is that they are your children. You must and can be here for each of them. Number three, the, the Torah speaks to each of the four children. Do not think that the Torah is a general document that works for many or most children. But there are more outcasts, misfits to whom the Torah does not relate. That is never the case. Mm -hmm. The Torah speaks to every child. Ju Judaism contains truths that can be related to every single child. We must, however, search for the proper words and approach how to make the Torah relevant and pal palpable to these. And I have my screen. It needs to be moved up. I can't see the next. Okay, sorry, sorry. Go, does this work? Yeah. Okay, where was I? Yeah, um, yeah. You must have a search for the proper words and approach. Right here where my mouth is. Can you see it? Oh. Oh, okay. We must discover how to give them the Torah in a way that they will appreciate how it speaks to their individual life with all their struggles and issues. Right. Okay. So the words speak for themselves, but I think these are very important ideas, and not just for our children, but I think for society, we have to accept that every human being is different. Not only are we different in our personalities, we're also different in our mission. My mission is not the same as your mission in this world or anyone else's mission. And therefore, really, the best way to uh, relate to others, the secret to all relationships, not just parents and children, but again, all relationships is to recognize that everyone is different. No two people are alike. And to embrace those differences, whether a person is a wise or a Russia or wicked, or one of these, just like these four children, God relates to each of them in a different way. That means that God embraces all of them. And it also means that God speaks to them in a different way as we should too. You know, I thank God, as you all know, I'm blessed to have 10 children. And I, it's amazing to me sometimes how each and every one of them is so different. There is no child that is like the next. I think that's why we keep trying to make them to see if someone will be identical to someone else, but it's not, it's not working. Not everyone is different, which reminds me, by the way, of um, I think one of the great verses in, in, in the Torah, in the Tanakh, more particularly. It's a verse from Isaiah, if I'm not mistaken, where Isaiah tells us, which means, that before I formed you in the womb of your mother, I knew you. God is telling us that even before we were formed in the womb of our mothers, we had a personality. He knew us. He knew who we were. What does that mean? That means that when we were in the womb of our mothers and when we come out of that womb, we're already formed. Our personality is already formed. And therefore the task of the parent is not to create a personality for the child. They already have one. Don't try and make him or her that which he is not, but rather to mold it and to channel it in the best of ways. It's a revolutionary idea in education, but this is what the Haggadah is teaching us. They're four sons. So your son is not a tzaddik. He's not a chacham. He's not wise. And maybe he's wicked, or maybe he's not wicked, and he is a, a wise, wise son. So they work with what you have, with what God gave him, the personality that God imbued in him. Don't try and make him into something he's not because that never works in education. So that's, that's again, insight number four, directly from the Haggadah, an important one. I think that speaks to the very heart of education. And number five, thank you to our woman. I think most of us here today are women, so you will love this. Ron, I see you there. You and I, my friend, we have to internalize these upcoming words. <laughs> and Mark also, is this Jackie or Mark? Okay. If it's Mark, that includes you. We got to internalize the upcoming words here. All right. <laughs> Let's go. Does anyone want to read? I'll read. Please. Carol, the first yeah. word's a little difficult, but be shim shim da. It's this that has stood strong for our ancestors and us. There is a question as to what the, this is referring to. What was, what was it that allowed us to endure? Some have 
suggested that it is referring to the Jewish women. Vahi, is that Vahi or Vahi? Vahi, Vahi, yeah. Vahi means she or her. It is an expression of third person feminine. Our survival as a people is to her. Merit of, of the righteous woman of the generation, our ancestors were redeemed from Egypt, the Talmud states. As the Mishra explains, after many decades of Jews being subjected to harsh labor in Egypt, the Jewish men had all but lost hope in redemption and had no desire to reproduce. The women, however, were confident that redemption was coming and were determined that the Jewish people continue on. Despite the horrible conditions, they concealed, they consoled their husbands, reassuring them that they would not stay enslaved forever, and they enticed them toward intimacy. Their defiant answer to the degree of sterilization was to continue to create and nurture life. And sure enough, the children that were brought into the world were the ones who witnessed God's miraculous redemption of the Jewish people from Egypt. But he, it is she, the Jewish woman, then and during all of history, who always maintained, remained the spine and backbone of our people through thick and thin. Take a moment to think about the women in your life who have brought hope and strength to your life. Think about what your life would be like without her. Right. So when we reach the moment in the Haggadah, Vihi Shamda, you know, everyone sings that song too. There's different tunes to it, and I won't sing it because I'm going to, uh, you're all going to uh, leave meeting and you're going to escape. <laughs> so I'll let someone else sing it, maybe. But when you sing the Vihi Shamda, that's really a moment in which we ought to contemplate and think of all of the lovely ladies in our lives of the woman who, because of them, really, thanks to them, we are who we are. And the Jewish world is the way it is and the way it continues to be. Um, I, I, I just, this idea reminded me really of the Midrash that spoke of how uh, the parents of Moses uh, were uh, separated for quite a while. Why? Because Moses' father, whose name was Amram, had decided to leave his wife saying that there's no need for me to be with you and to bring children to such an evil world. Remember, they were living in Egypt under tremendous uh, 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 suffering and conditions of slavery. And Amram said, why bring a child into a world that's so filled with evil? Why bring a child that will be doomed to, will be destined to suffer the rest of his life? So he separated from his wife. Moses wasn't born yet, but they did have a child by the name of Miriam all the sister of Moses. And Miriam went to her father and said, how dare you leave mommy? Yes, I understand you. You don't want to bring children to the world, but look, you're worse than Pharaoh. Pharaoh's decree is to drown all the baby boys. You want to stop having boys and girls, so you're worse than Pharaoh. So go back to your mom, to my mom. So go back to your wife. And Amram was convinced by the words of his daughter, and they went back together, and then they had Moses. So thanks to Miriam, who persisted and ensured that her parents would get back to each other, that they had a child who really saved the Jewish world and is recognized maybe as the foremost leader of Jewish history. But again, this was the persistence, the resilience, the perseverance of our uh, Jewish woman throughout history. And it is that which we celebrate during the Passover night. I think it could be the same could be said about the post Holocaust generation. Many said, I know Elie Wiesel writes about it in his memoirs, but many said, many survivors thought that why bring children into a world that can experience such evil, evil that we ourselves uh, experienced firsthand. And it was the Jewish woman again who persevered and said, no, we have to create these Jewish families. There's no greater revenge to Hitler than continuing to build the Jewish family and, and uh, create children. And so they did. And so they are celebrated. Okay, so that's Vehi, Vehi Shamda. Two more insights. Uh, the sixth one takes us to probably uh, many people's favorite Passover song, the song of Dayenu. Does anyone want to read the sixth insight? 
<clears throat> Janet, you cleared your throat. That means you want to read. Oh, no, I was going to actually, I was going to ask a question. Oh, yes. Okay. Go Sorry. For go for <laughs> but it. I, I, don't, I know that we're, you know, don't have a lot of time. So I was just very um, quickly, yeah. because of the woman being so highly respected and the backbone, is that where it comes the orthodox feeling? And I could be wrong what I'm saying, but the like women being superior and that's why they're, they don't pray or they don't have to pray. So that's right. And that, that's a good question. That stems from Kabbalah. Kabbalah that teaches us the root of souls. And the root of uh, uh, women's souls is, is higher than the root of the souls of men. Uh, women are indeed more spiritual. They're more in tune with their soul than men are. I think it's a fact of life, unfortunately, because uh, I think uh, women, uh, the statistics about this, and I remember reading it, but women um, claim to be there are many more women that claim to be spiritual than men or claim to have intuitions and all sorts of you know gut feelings and so on than men and i i think those statistics again prove this point that their souls are on a high level they're more in tune with godliness than men are okay. so that that's another thought that really emphasizes this idea yeah yeah good point. thank you sure now someone else can read <laughs> okay <laughs> fine does anyone want to read here Dayenu? we have just two more insights the seventh one i promise you sure sixth one yeah i'll read Surely go for it yes okay um here Dayenu, a blueprint for life there seems to be something disturbing when we look at some of the words of the Dayenu. if you had split the sea but not let us through it in dryness Dayenu, it would have been enough Really, could that really have been enough? What, what would we gain from a parted sea if we could not get through it and escape the progressing Egyptians? We sing further, if he would have drowned our oppressors in the sea but did not provide for our needs in the desert for 40 years, Dayenu, it would have been enough. Again, we need to ask the question, would it really have been enough? We would have died in the desert and the list goes on. The truth is that Dayenu is much more than just a simple melody, a catchy tune, a children's song. It contains a tremendous, profound message. It teaches us how to look at life. A person can live life with two very different perspectives. You can always focus on what you are missing, or you can focus on what you have. This is the message of Dayenu. Of course, we did not want to remain stuck in the desert or by the sea, etc. But Dayenu teaches us that we take nothing for granted. We appreciate everything. Dayenu telling us, be grateful for everything and say Dayenu for everything. In order to have a meaningful life, in order to be free, we need to be grateful for every single blessing in life. We ought not to take anything for granted. Indeed, whatever we have is a gift. Right. I think that, by the way, this is one of the greatest blessings and messages of the coronavirus, of this terrible pandemic, which hopefully is slowly but surely on its way out. Who knows? But uh, that when the world stopped, we had to face inward. And we had to begin to appreciate the blessings that maybe we never knew we really had. If you think about this, but a year ago on Passover, most of us were forced to do Passover just by ourselves. Uh, maybe not even with our families if your children are grown up. Just by ourselves. Then we had a decision to make. Will we cry and moan the fact that no one is there? Or we will appreciate just the holiness of this holiday the meaning of this holiday and at the same time the fact that we're healthy and thank God we're not uh, sick like so many others were a year ago. You know, the, those, those simple blessings of life. It's all a question of our perspective, of, of it's a matter of perspective. We can say, Dayenu, thank you God for everything that we have. Or we can say, you know, let's complain and fetch and uh, as they say also in Yiddish. And uh, that's the difference between having truly a happy life or a sour life? It's the perspective of Dayenu or not. Okay, that's number six. And number seven, we'll conclude with this and then I, maybe with the story about Elijah too. Does anyone want to conclude here with the seventh insight? I'll do it again. Okay, thank you, Julie. <laughs> Saving the day, go for it. Opening the door for Elijah. A remarkable ceremony was instituted by Rabbi Naftali of Rapschitz 
the cup of Elijah, symbol of the messianic future, was passed from person to person at the table. Each person poured a little wine into Elijah's cup from his own cup until it was filled. The tradition expressed the truth that Elijah's cup is filled from all our wines. We must act together, each contributing to his own best talents and energies to bring Elijah's promise to the world. Only through the efforts, efforts of our hands will the world be redeemed. Right. And everyone in a way has to contribute his own Elijah to the whole. And if we can each bring our own Elijah to the whole, then the world will be redeemed. Speaking of that, I just want to conclude with this story about the... Maybe it's a story I've shared in the past, but it's about one of the students of the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, who had heard from the Baal Shem Tov that if you fast for 40 days, then you'll be able to see Elijah the prophet. Elijah the prophet will come down to this world and visit you. So the student got all excited and he said, fine, I'm going to fast for 40 days too. And he fasted for 40 days. And on the 41st day, he's waiting outside his home to see if Elijah will indeed come to visit him. By the end of that day, no one came to visit him. So he got all upset and he went to the Baal Shem Tov and he said, your promise didn't materialize itself. I fasted for 40 days and Elijah didn't come. Baal Shem Tov says, said to him, no, 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 there's one more thing you need to do and then Elijah will come and reveal himself to you. What is it? Well, there's this poor family in our village. You have to bring them some boxes of food. Passover is coming. Bring them meat, matzah, wine, whatever they need. And then you'll see Elijah the prophet. The man says, fine. He packs all these boxes, brings them nine boxes of food. He leaves, he goes back to his home, and now he's waiting for Elijah. Elijah, again, doesn't come that whole day. Now he's really upset, and he went to the Baal Shem Tov, and he said, you're a liar. You said that Elijah will come. He still hasn't revealed himself to me. The Baal Shem Tov says, yes, no, there's, I promise you, just one last thing you need to do, <clears throat> and then you'll merit the revelation of Elijah. What is that last thing? He said to him, in a few days from now, no, in a few days from now, I want you to go back to that home of that poor family, and this time, don't bring them anything. Just stand outside by the window and listen to the conversation in their home. But a few days go by and this man goes back to this poor family's home. This time he stands outside and he listens in to the conversation in the home. And the conversation in the home goes like this. The little boy sees his mother crying and he tells his mother, mom, why are you crying? His mom says, well, because uh, we have no more food in the home. And I don't know how I'm gonna be able to provide for you. We have nothing to eat. And the little boy trying to comfort his mother said to his mother, well, remember that in a, a few days ago we were in the exact same situation. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, Elijah the prophet came to our home and brought us nine boxes of food. So I'm sure he'll come back again. This man now standing outside realizes, oh, that's the Elijah the prophet that the Baal Shem Tov was referring to. Not someone coming from the heaven, but it's the Elijah prophet within us. That, that Elijah the prophet within that brings nine boxes of food to people. That's the Elijah the, uh, the prophet that I will be able to see. The Baal Shem Tov was right. And every one of us is an Elijah the prophet. And if we can make that Elijah the prophet propel us to do good, to add in uh, actions of goodness and kindness, to the world around us, whether it's poor family in our own villages, or whether it's other types of good actions that no doubt will contribute by contributing that Elijah the prophet to the whole, no doubt we too will be able to bring about uh, not just the revelation of Elijah the prophet within, but also the Elijah the prophet without, with the coming of Mashiach, may it happen speedily. Amen.